Okay, I just want to make sure you all have a good sense of humor, because otherwise this is your chance to um, get out of here. <laughs> so you realize you're not going to be hearing about spinning wheels and quilting bees, right? Yeah. Okay, and I like a lot of feedback, so the more you laugh and the more you grimace, the better I do. Okie doke? Good. So my name is Velia. This is my daughter, Eris, who unfortunately has sawdust in her eye and is in agony over there, so she's not going to be talking too much today. But we recently wrote a, a mother-daughter memoir called How to Survive a Brazilian Betrayal, and doing the re which is going to be released on Mother's Day. Doing the research for the book is what really got us obsessed with the lives of colonial women. But I kind of have to give you our backstory to explain how this all came to be. So in 2010, some pretty crummy stuff happened to us as a family, and we no longer had any hopes or dreams or goals or money, but we needed a place to heal. So we found this foreclosed farmhouse in Woodbury, Connecticut. It was vacant for five years. It was in foreclosure. We knew nothing about it, except we thought maybe it was built in about 1850. So we made a joke offer to the bank. Never in a million years did we think they'd accept our offer, but they did. And we moved in in the winter of 2011, which remember was that really, 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 really bad winter. Yeah. So what happened was, in the five years the house was vacant, they were sending property maintenance guys over to take care of the snow and take care of the grass. And then we, we pieced the rest of this together. Apparently, just before we moved in, there was a bunch of ice up on the roof. And they sent over a couple of dopes who went up on the roof with axes and hatchets, and they wound up making a hole in the roof, unbeknownst to us. So that by the time we moved in, our kitchen ceiling sheetrock was soaking wet. And when my husband Jim pulled it down, we discovered these original hand-hewn log beams. That's just how we were. So we were like, holy smoke, this is an old house, because we had no idea. So the very next day, I raced off to Woodbury Town Hall. I spent the entire day there, traced the deed back to 1770. <coughs> I don't think they can get, I don't think the lights can go down. We, we were trying. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I, we were trying with the lights. I think it's dark as it'll go. Um, Chase deed back to 1770, signed by King George III, Colony of Connecticut. And I didn't realize it then, but in retrospect, I know that's when my healing started. The next thing that happened was in our kitchen, we had this old wood stove. And the six months that we lived in the house, I just always had a feeling there was something cool behind the wood stove, and it just kind of gnawed away at me. So one night at dinner, I mentioned it to my husband, or my whole family, and within five minutes, Jim went down to the basement. He came back upstairs with pry bars and sledgehammers. And I always say I took these pictures with my junky, crummy camera. Never in a million years I think anybody but our family would see them. And now it turns out, and the whole time the kids were like, Mommy, we had chill with the camera. Turns out I got the last laugh because now about 35,000 people have seen these photos. <laughs> so the next day Jim came home with a jackhammer, which really didn't work very well. Went back to the regular um, hammers. And this is the worst photo ever <laughs> taken of us. Arisa. <laughs> Eris and I include this in almost everything that we do because we have a lot of events at our house and people come over, they see everything all spiffed up. They don't realize the three tons of cement and brick and field stone we lugged out of the house. Another funny story about this picture is I mentioned that Eris and I just wrote a book and we're working with an agent in Los Angeles and somehow she wound up seeing this picture and she said to Eris, Eris, your father is so handsome, he should be a movie star. And we're like, he is a handsome guy, but in that picture, I mean, he looks really, really bad. So it was worth it because this is what was behind there. And then around the corner, there was another solid sheetrock wall. And Eris and Jim pretty much did this one by themselves. And this is what was behind there. Oh, wow. And this is how it looks today. I know it's the freakiest story there really is. And then we've had two paranormal investigations with really documented evidence that they found. We've torn up all of our flooring. We found all Kingswood floor, flooring in the upstairs. So I think you can just kind of see for someone who was originally a history teacher to begin with, how this all just kind of came to be. So, History, I mean, the title of my presentation is what life was really, uh, I'm trying to hurry up because it's really a 60 minute talk I'm trying to get into 45 minutes. <laughs> the not so good life of the colonial good wife, what life was really like for New England's colonial women because we've always been curious. Now, Eris is 20, Eris with the sawdust in her eye, is 26 years old. And when I was Eris's age, I never really thought too much about being a woman or about being a female. I just kind of took it for granted. But now the older I've gotten and the more women I've met through my journey for the good, through the good stuff and the bad stuff, I really have this huge respect for women. And women helping women really has become my thing. So if you take nothing else from this presentation this afternoon, I want you to think about this quotation. History of all times, up today especially, teaches that women will be forgotten if they forget to think about themselves. Now, Eris calls this my amnesia card because it says, my name is Velia Jance Urban. Like, I know that, but bear with me. So my name is Velia Jance Urban, but if this was 1949, the year my mom was married, I'd probably be introduced to you as Mrs. James Urban. 
And if this was 1770, I would legally have a first name, but believe it or not, I'd be introduced to you as James Urban, his wife. And I forgot to mention that I, lugged, I dragged Eris around to a lot of cemeteries. She was a relatively good sport. We took some good photos in cemeteries. Now, if I died and James remarried, that woman would be his now wife. So there's no such thing as a second wife or a third wife. Whoever the guy was currently married to was the now wife. And here's where the chuckles usually start. If, I, if James died, I would be his relic. <laughs> And a relic was just exactly what it sounds like. It was a remnant or a leftover of a relationship that no longer existed. Um, but once again, this is all over our New England cemeteries. I just never noticed it until I was looking for it. Now, legally, the death of the male head of the family meant the disillusion of the family. And by law, the widow inherited one third of the household goods. There's, cause there's kind of some confusion who got the other two thirds. Some people say it was the kids. Some people say it was the dead guy's family. That's not really my point. My point is, very often a widow would be reluctant to remarry, because if she did, she had to turn everything over to the new husband. So in the 1600s and 1700s, um, women of ordinary status, just like us, they were called good wife, which was shortened to goody. So just the exact same way that we use the term Mrs. or Ms., that's all that meant. So if you read The Crucible and all that goody proctor stuff, that's all they're talking about. Now, I used to say it was a soggy sheetrock that started this whole thing, but then I realized that life is really just a series of events. So even though I've lived in Connecticut all my life, it wasn't until about three years ago that I went to the Mark Twain house. Have you guys all been there? Yes. yes. Good. So the Mark Twain house is cool. I mean, it's really cool. But the Mark Twain house is kind of about the stuff that's in the house. What's even cooler is if you go across the driveway over to Harriet Beecher Stowe's house. Yes. And at first I was like, Harriet Beecher Stowe, who cares? Which sounds terrible for an English teacher. But <laughs> Harriet Beecher Stowe house is really where I got my aha moment. Because in the Harriet Beecher Stowe house, it talks about how the different events in her life led her to write Uncle Tom's Cabin. And that's when I realized it was never just one event in my life or your life that make up a life. It's a whole series of things. So my point is, the next thing that happened in my journey was Hurricane Irene. I don't know if you, did you guys have it badly here? Oh, yeah. In Connecticut, we, we wound up not having power for 10 days. So what happened was, I kind of started living at Woodbury Library because I could go to the bathroom, I could get a drink, I could flush the toilet, you know what it's like. My husband was going to work, and I sound like an unfit mother, but I actually have no memory of where the kids were that entire time. <laughs> But at Woodbury Library, they ha it's the, there's a checkout desk. And then behind the checkout desk, there's books you can't take out of the library, but you can look at them in the library. So there was this little tiny black book. Um, I asked the librarian to hand it to me. I don't, even, I don't know why, what possessed me to ask for it. it. Turned out to be the most fascinating book I think I've ever read. It was called Barnes Mortality Record. And what it was, it was a listing of the deaths in Woodbury from I think it was 1672 to present day. But present day was really 1899. And what it was, it would talk about when the person died, um, the person's name, and sometimes how the person died. But this is when I was introduced to the term coverture. So coverture is the idea that at birth, a female baby was covered by her father's identity, and then when she married by her husband's. Husband and wife became one, and that one was the husband. That's why women took the last names of their husbands. So in this Barnes mortality record, of course um, women had first names, but I would say, 75% of the time, when a woman died, her death was listed like this. Samuel Carr's wife, Josiah Gilbert's wife, Jeremiah Burton's wife. I came across quite a few slaves. We lived in Bridgewater, Connecticut for 26 years. So this interested me. So this is the widow of Harmon Stoddard. The woman lived to be 87 years old, but still had no first name. But most shocking of all to me was, almost every single time a baby died, it was as if the mother didn't exist at all, because the death would be something like this. Edward Pond's child. Jacob Lindsay's child. So, so, let me back up a second. So, the American colonial period lasts from 1607, when Jamestown was founded, to 1781, when Cornwallis surrendered at Yorktown. So that's a 175-year period. So when I'm speaking this afternoon, keep in mind what was happening in 1607 wasn't necessarily happening in 1781. It'd be like comparing 2019 to 1844. So just keep that in mind. So today we're, today we're gonna find out what life was really like for New England's colonial women. We're gonna hit on those topics that people never really talk about. Things like menstruation, sex and birth control, childbirth, sickness and medicine, and I think we're probably gonna have to chop out the odds and ends, but you get the idea. So should we jump right in there with menstruation? Are you ready? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> So colonial women had far fewer periods than women of today because they spent so much of their adult life either pregnant or breastfeeding that years and years and years could go by without them having a period. 
So apparently colonial girls got their first period at about age 17. And I always ask audiences, what do you think it is today? I think statistics wise, it's 12 and a half, but I have a friend who teaches in Waterbury, Connecticut, and she has a pregnant 12 year old in her class. That's not really my point. My point is their girls were 17, <laughs> our girls were 12. So there's a five year difference right there. So the average age of marriage for women was 22. They weren't getting married age 14 and 15 like we're led to believe. The first child was born about 16 months later. The last child when the woman's around 40. So woman's last child and her first grandchild could be about the same age. Now the euphemisms for menstruation were flowers, horses, terms, and the custom of women. And every time I see this slide, I think about Burnham Elementary School where our kids went and the reading program they used back then because they used something called explode the code. And when you're doing research from another era, you kind of have to explode the code to figure out what the heck are they talking about. Like a woman might say to another woman, I haven't had those for a while, meaning she was pregnant. Or a man might say she hasn't had her courses, meaning she was pregnant. And a menopausal woman might be described as no longer having the custom of women. So in the 1700s, nobody wore underwear because it was invented about 1825. But night and day, men and women wore something called a chemise or a shift. Okay. In, I, love, I love this quotation. In 1757, a doctor said, women shouldn't wear pants or underwear because her genitals needed air to allow moisture to evaporate, which could otherwise cause them to decay. <laughs> <laughs> but he said it, it was OK in cold weather or to protect against insects. <laughs> so when it finally was worn, underwear was crotchless. And we still call it a pair of underwear today because it really was a leg and a leg sewn together. Now, one of the things Eris and I love about doing our presentations is that we meet so many cool people in our travels. And we spoke at a place called, I think it was Wilbraham um, Historical Society. And after our talk, they took us over to the museum part of it. And they actually showed us a pair of crotchless underwear, which to me was like getting a winning lottery ticket because to actually see a pair in real life was amazing to me. <laughs> but all of this made me wonder, what did women do when they had their period? So would you like to find out? Yes. Yes. They would take tallow, which is just animal fat. They would rub it on their thighs to keep the moisture away. Then they would take a hunk of sheepskin, and they would cut it to the right size. Then they put the first side up against their crotch, kind of tuck it there, and just kind of go about their day. Then they'd boil these. I love, wish you guys could see your faces. Then they'd boil these things and reuse them over and over again. And the second most common thing, they would take cheesecloth that was stuffed with milkweed fluff or moss. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now, when I first started this talk, it was only about colonial women, and there were only women in the audience. But now this talk has kind of taken on a life of its own, and I digress a lot because I've learned so many cool things. Like, for instance, did you know, in the United States, in the 1900s, down south in the cotton mills, they used to spread floor, straw on the floor. Because when women had their period, they were practicing something back then called free bleeding. And they just used to drip into the straw when they had their periods. And to me, it just amazes me in the 1900s in Connecticut, that's how it was. I mean, the United States is how it was. Now, much, much later in history, there was a something invented called menstrual suspenders. At first, I thought that bag thing was inside of you. The bag wasn't inside of you, just kind of dangled there like udders. <laughs> now, this next photo, I made absolutely sure I credited my source because I wonder who in the world would pose for this photo. Okay. When I got this photo, I sent it to my friend Rachel, who owns Community Acupuncture in Woodbury, which has nothing to do with the story. But within like four seconds, she sent me back this photo. <laughs> All right, they passed our test errors. Once in a great while, we do a presentation, and nobody laughs at this slide. And I'm like, oh my god, I have like 45 minutes to go. This is not going to go well. <laughs> You passed, so that's good. Now, about a year and a half ago, we were speaking at a place called Hopkins Vineyard. And when we were all done, Eris is with me, of course. When we were all done, these four women came up to us. And they said they were all 74 years old. And they said, not this, but the menstrual suspenders didn't seem that weird to them. Because when they were girls, they all wore these things called sanitary belts. This is when the heads all go like this. Somehow, I escaped these things. First of all, look in the bottom left-hand corner where it says rust-proof. Doesn't that kind of crack you up? <laughs> And you see the naked women there? Doesn't mind you of the truck drivers with those naked women mud flaps? <laughs> so I had heard about these sanitary belts, but I swear when the women were telling their stories about it, Eris's mouth was pretty much just hanging open. And I think the sanitary belts to Eris seemed as crazy as the menstrual suspenders seemed to me. And I cannot believe in our lifetime, this is how women dealt with their periods. And with all the women we've spoken to, 
Only one woman said that, oh, these things were far superior to what we have today. Everybody else said they were like wearing a diaper, they leaked, and they were horrible. Now, as a tampon user, I wonder were there tampons during their colonial era? What do you think? No. Sure. There yes. were, but the recipe doesn't sound too pleasant. I'll let you read the recipe. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are a good audience, I can tell. <laughs> wow. Difficult to see. Can I read it? Take half a drop of uh, some of the stuff I can't even pronounce. Of trackle something, the same amounts of cockle flour and myrrh, and grind them together with bull's gall, in which rue has been rotted. Then cover the mixture with cotton, and thereof make a suppository as large as your little finger. But first anoint it with clean honey and oil together. Sprinkle powder of scammony on it and put it in your, the best part, privy member. <laughs> so I always say, first of all, I think the privy member is the best part. Second of all, I've usually said about 10 times right now that we're really into alternative medicine and Eris is an herbalist and there's some stuff in this recipe, we still don't know what some of this stuff is. Now, I'm pretty green. I believe in reducing, reusing, recycling. So one day, not too long ago, I was kind of messing around on Etsy. I don't even know what I was looking for. But I came across these, this next slide I'm going to share with you. When I showed it to Eris, Eris thought this was something from the colonial era. It's not. But did you know on Etsy, four for $15, you can buy crocheted washable <laughs> tampons. I was speaking somewhere. Guy put up his hand. He said they reminded him of corn the cob holders, don't they? <laughs> so my point is, what I love about history is the whole full circle aspect of things. So I totally get it why women are using these today. There's so many creepy chemicals and tampons. They're getting these things, they're using them, they're boiling them, using it over again, just like the sheepskin, and I just love the whole full circle aspect of it. So, you probably think I'm a real weirdo, but for something else I was doing, I was doing a bunch of research on tampons. And I was sitting alone in my old house, and I came across these two inventions, both of them invented by men, and I started thinking, these are the two stupidest inventions I have ever heard of. <laughs> Then I started kind of daydreaming in my head in my old house, and I was thinking, what would some colonial woman have thought if she knew about these inventions? So the first one, invented in 2010 by a man. So you know how we all have our, our cell phones. We use them for texting. We use them for photos. This guy came up with the brilliant idea of linking your tampon to your cell phone. <laughs> well, if you can't, tampon is changing. And even worse, he came up with the idea for call forwarding. So if you're out to lunch with your boss, your boss get the phone call, remind you to change your tampons. This is a realio trulio invention. I can't believe how stupid it is. And can you imagine what some colonial Connecticut or colonial New England woman have thought if she knew about this one? The next one, also made by a man in 1999. You know how a lot of women have menstrual cramps? This guy had the brilliant idea that if you're having an orgasm at the same time you were having your menstrual cramps, then the menstrual cramps would be lessened. So he came up with the idea for a vibrating tampon. <laughs> he was there. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good area. <laughs> he was very proud of the fact. I have to get up here and talk about this stuff. You guys are He was very proud of the fact that all that electronical stuff was not inside you. It kind of dangled here, so you weren't getting any shocks inside your vagina. And then during a talk, not that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's pretty good. We were doing a talk not that long ago, and there was a little old lady sitting right about here, and she said, I keep looking at figure four, and it looks like a mouse trap, doesn't it? <laughs> so it's kind of funny. Okay. Moving on to sex and birth control. So a medical guide from that era said that women are but men turned outside in, and they, these people, poor people walking in now, and they believe the vagina and ovaries were internal versions of the penis and testicles. But they believe that women's bodies were weaker, we are more prone to disease, we lack the heat to grow external genitals, and so women were designed by God to be subordinate to men. And they believed that women needed sex for their health and well-being, and we had less control over our sexual desires. And they also believed that celibate women developed something called green sickness. And if you had green sickness, your arms and legs kind of swelled up, your heart had heart palpitations, and your face turned kind of green. And you know what the remedy was for green sickness? Sex. Well, you're close. What went hand in hand with sex? No one's <laughs> <laughs> ever said that. Lately, people have been saying masturbation. Like, no, 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 marriage. So maybe marriage would cure all this. So birth control before the early 1800s were things like sea sponges, quinine, 
rock salt, and a mixture of crocodile dung and honey put inside the vagina to help prevent pregnancy. When I learned this, I wondered, where did some little colonial lady get her hands on crocodile poop? <laughs> and the person that kind of made it make most sense to me was our son, Mick. So Mick went to the University of Puerto Rico. He loved it so much that he stayed there. But he came up and he heard one of my talks. And he said, Mommy, I think you have to stop and think that to the colonists, a crocodile would be this fantastical creature, like something like a unicorn or the Loch Ness Monster would be to us. And the fact that it was crocodile poop really had nothing to do with it. It was just this dried powder that mixed with honey that once went inside, went inside the vagina, kind of acted as a diaphragm sort of thing. So the fact that it was crocodile poop really had nothing to do with it. Um, in terms of birth control, you should also hang rabbit poop tied in mule's head over your bed. You could toss seeds in a river. You could uh, turn the wheel of a grain mill backwards at midnight. <laughs> <laughs> Women should touch sapphires or emeralds. I don't know how many of those were hanging around around here. It was suggest, suggest that women try jumping backwards seven times after intercourse to expel sperm. <laughs> it was in Victoria, yeah. Did you, did you guys see that? Yes. They should drink the water that blacksmiths use to cool metals. I do not get that one at all. And you should smear ginger, tobacco juice, olive oil, or pomegranate pulp around the vagina to help kill sperm. So condoms existed, and they were made of animal intestines, linen soaked in sulfur or lye, or fish bladder. And they said the problem with them was that they fell off. Now, I always say, to me, falling off would be the least of the problems. I would not want something soaked in lye inside of me, would you? <laughs> and I've gone on to, to do more research about condoms. And apparently, I like the visual image of this. Apparently, you kept these things on with a little ribbon. And I just picture a little purple bow <laughs> on the end of this thing, don't you? <laughs> now, when you we're going to take them with us there, so we go. <laughs> now, when you do research responsibly, you really should see your information more than one place. So the next thing I'm going to share with you, I swear I saw in a minimum of four different places that another thing that was used as a condom was a turtle shell. I was speaking somewhere. Once again, a little lady raised her hand, and she said, was the turtle still inside? <laughs> so for the life of me, I cannot figure out how this thing was a condom. A diaphragm, I like totally get it, but easily, easily I saw it in four different places. So Eris and I are always doing research because we, we do all kinds of different talks and classes. And I think this next thing I'm going to share with you is probably the most interesting thing I've ever researched. So we're all familiar with Queen Anne's lace, wild carrot, yes? So it was used as a contraceptive because the seeds blocked progesterone synthesis and acted kind of as a morning after form of birth control. So very mild side effects, maybe constipation, and women could stop taking Queen Anne's lace and the guan could see, conceive a child normally. Um, the only danger was mixing up Queen Anne's lace with the very poisonous water hemlock. And we all know what happened to Socrates. Now, as I mentioned, Eris is an herbalist, and she went to a big women's herbal conference in New Hampshire this summer, and there was a workshop on modern women today using Queen Anne's lace seeds as a pretty effective contraceptive. But my thing is, how in the world did somebody figure that out? How did you figure out that chewing on Queen Anne's lace seeds is a pretty effective contraceptive? A lot of the other remedies we research you can figure out, but that one just blows my mind. I think it's so cool. Yeah, she on it. Yeah, and still today, right, Eris? On the flower. On the seeds. Yep. The seeds. On the seeds, yeah. Yep. I would maybe use a little backup contraceptive. <laughs> so um, I found conflicting information about abortions. So abortion, abortion before quickening, when the baby moves, that wasn't considered illegal, but it was considered immoral. Abortions after quickening, they were illegal. Now, there was this um, thing called the Brigham Family Notebook. And what it was, it was a bunch of recipes and remedies handed down over this Brigham family of women who went on to find the hospital. I always forget the name of Brigham Women's Hospital. And what it was, it was a bunch of recipes and remedies handed down over the generations. And in this, in this notebook, there was a recipe called to cleanse the womb. So I did a lot of research on this, and I could never figure out, was this a recipe to bring about your period if your period was late? Was it a recipe to bring about an abortion or a miscarriage? Before the recipe, there's this little kind of sinister, kind of evil sounding warning. I'll let you read this, which would make me think twice about drinking this stuff. I mean, wouldn't you think twice? Yeah. And here's the actual recipe. So the jury's out. I was not able to find out late period or abortion. But uh, I have to say that six of those herbs are known abortifacients, you know, herbs that bring about an abortion. And that would be madder roots, juniper berries, mother of time, 
mugwort, motherwort, and saffron. But one thing for sure, if you're pregnant in the colonial era, you didn't just hop in your car and drive to CVS for a pregnancy test, but there were three things a woman could do if she thought she was pregnant. So a woman could urinate on seed corn, and the seed sprouted, she was pregnant. This next one's the best. The urine of a woman, if left in a bottle for a few days, would spontaneously generate tiny animals if she was pregnant. <laughs> And then a particular, and people say that they may think of little sea monkeys, you know, when they think that one. <laughs> and a particular vein, a woman's lower eyelid would swell if the woman was pregnant. Now, we laugh at this, but I think you're probably all familiar with the rabbit test. Yeah. So when I teach to less teenage girls, I have no idea what I'm talking about. So from 1930s to 1950s, if a woman thought she was pregnant, they would take her urine, inject it into a female juvenile rabbit. They would wait a few days. Then if the rabbit's ovaries enlarge, the woman was pregnant. And the euphemism used to be, the rabbit died. But newsflash, the rabbit always died because they had to kill the rabbit to see the rabbit's um, ovaries. So when I told Eris about this and shared this photo with Eris, I think the rabbit test to Eris seemed as crazy as the urinating on the seed corn seemed to me. And once again, I can't believe in our lifetime, this is how women found out they were pregnant. And once again, I had an older doctor in an audience one time, and he said there was also something called the frog test, the exact same test, but they used frogs. So women in early America, they referred to childbirth as the greatest of earthly miseries, and they faced childbirth not with joy, but with the fear of their lives. Now, once again, the sources differ, but everything says that somewhere between 25 and 50% of women died in childbirth. And since wow. most women were pregnant between eight and 10 times, there's a pretty good chance that something bad was gonna happen to you. But as bad as those numbers were, it got even worse after the 1750s. Do you know why? You do know why. Cities. Not cities. Physicians. Who said doc? Yes. It wasn't so much doc. Yeah. Seventeen are when men and forceps got into the act. It wasn't so much they were men, but they would take these forceps, then use them on me, then use them on you, then use them on you without washing them. So they introduced bacteria into the birth canal. Um, midwives called them hands of iron. They also had these things called cervical dilators. And I think probably every woman in this room has seen a modern day speculum, which they look pretty unpleasant, but look what they look like in the 1770s. Oh. <laughs> So I always say that I wouldn't even use those things on a cow, and I can see, see why it got so much worse. So women feared giving birth, and this is one New England minister's comforting words to pregnant women. He said, for you ought to know your death has entered into you. That was actual quotation. Wow. So there were three things a woman did. She found out she was pregnant. She would, of course, make clothes for the baby. She would wash and iron her special childbed linen. Then the really sad one, she prepared lengths of linen for her own burial shroud. Such a high probability she wasn't going to be surviving. On a funnier note, just kind of raise the mood here, I think you probably all heard of Nicholas Culpepper. He was one of those famous herbalists from the 1600s. So we have his books all over our house. So I think the way Nicholas Culpepper envisioned the different womb positions just kind of cracks me up. <laughs> it looks like some Zumba classes going on in there, doesn't it? <laughs> so, so birth was the exclusive province of women, and it kind of worked on the idea of female reciprocity. So it might not be your mom or your sister that would be there for, in your time. It might be the woman in the house six fields away, but she knew that you would then be there for her. Um, women gave birth fully clothed. It was very hard to find, a, find an illustration without, without a guide there. I just wanted to show you this. For one reason, because houses were so cold, and also because of a sense of modesty. Um, calling the women together. Oh, you know what I forgot to talk about? The um, lying in. I think the only thing women had, colonial women had over us was the lying in period. So what happened was, for three to four weeks after you had your baby, your friends would come over, they would do your chores for you, take care of your baby. Um, we have a friend who just had her second baby. She went home to absolutely no help at all, just her husband, and she was in the hospital for just six hours. So I think the colonial women, at least they had about three to four months to get back on their feet. They didn't have to just right, jump back into everything. Again, what I was going to say was calling the women together to find the active state of labor, and it was the husband's job to go out and round up all the women and bring them to the house. And once again, I love the whole full circle aspect of the birthing stool. Every midwife used one, and so many women today are using them again in childbirth, you know, acting on, on the idea of gravity. So every midwife had her secret trick to dislodge a difficult birth. So there's something called a quilled baby. So the idea here was they put a little snuff or sneezing powder on the quill, then you would snuff it up, you'd give this big sneeze, and your baby would pop out. <laughs> Now, I would say, I gave birth to two big babies, totally naturally. Mick was almost 10 pounds, and it would have been the sneeze of the century that would have pushed Mick out. So, <laughs> so like I say, every midwife had, had her own little tricks. For this one, you needed the hair of a virgin, um, milk from a red cow, and I think it's 12 ants eggs. So let you take a look at that. 12, 12 ants eggs, yes. 
Excuse me? You like me to turn over a rock in those white things that are there? You send your husband? Yeah. <laughs> now, I think the saddest thing I have to talk about is they had very crude cesareans that the baby could be saved, but be a death sentence for the mother. And if the baby could not be saved, what they would do is they would call in a barber or a surgeon, and while the mother was still awake, because there was no anesthesia until about the Civil War, and the baby was still alive, they would dismember the baby and pull it out piece by piece. Oh. And that's the one where I get it that things were bad for men. I totally get that. But to me, it was the day in, day out horribleness of life for women. That could happen to you, and you could go on to have six, seven, eight more pregnancies. And to me, it's a miracle any of these women survived any of this stuff. Now, in the 1800s, babies weren't nursed immediately. You know how nowadays we know, yes, of course, you should nurse your baby. But if you're not going to nurse your baby, at least let the baby get the colostrum. Yes. They thought colostrum was this evil, horrible stuff. And they went to all kinds of lengths to get rid of colostrum and bring on the flow of true milk. Like one thing they did, for instance, a woman who just had a baby, they would give her beer. Because hops really does bring on the flow of true milk. These next three I can never do without laughing. But to bring on the flow of true milk, very often midwives massaged the women's breasts throughout the colostrum. Midwives suckled the women's breasts throughout the colostrum. And if that didn't work, if there were any puppies or kittens hanging around, <laughs> they used them. And if that's funny to you, it's even funnier to me because that puppy is now our dog, Myra. And I just picture Myra latched onto some woman kind of helping her out. So, I mean, there was a method to their madness. <laughs> I love looking at the faces. I love, there was method. Suckling really does bring on the flow of true milk. Unfortunately, they were throwing away the colostrum just to get to the to true milk. So hiring a wet nurse was considered a very dangerous practice because they believed the baby would take on the characteristics of whoever had nursed it. So this is when I start looking around the room. And they would never, ever, ever use a red-haired woman as a wet nurse because they believed they were kind of psycho. And they would pass, <laughs> well, they said bad-tempered. I said psycho. And they would kind of pass on their psycho characteristics. And they also believed a woman should only suckle a baby the same age and sex as her own child. Otherwise, when a woman would give birth to a boy and then suckle the girl, would pass on the masculine characteristics and vice versa. So it was very tough to find women who met these crazy criteria. So up here in New England, at that point, they really weren't using wet nurses very often. Down south, they were. And that's one of the reasons families were so much larger, because women were ovulating so much earlier. And I thought it was kind of cute. Apparently, it was very common to see an ad like this in newspapers down south. <laughs> So unlike today, the midwife cut the umbilical cord. They left it long for boys and short for girls because they believed a boy with a short cord would have to be weak and effeminate, and a girl with a long cord would have to be sexually promiscuous and rebellious. And they believed, how this would happen, I have no idea, if the cord ever touched the floor, then that baby would never be toilet trained. So. <laughs> so babies were swaddled for 12 to 24 hours at a time for up to six months. So what would happen was these babies were usually put in the care of the older kids in the family because the moms were so busy. And what they would do, they would swaddle them to something called a swaddling board, then they'd hang them up from beams or pegs in the kitchen. Because the colonists, they didn't have any screen doors. That's just our kitchen. <laughs> they didn't have any screen doors, and their doors were always wide open. So animals, especially pigs, were always wandering in and out of the house. So they didn't hang these babies up out of harm's way. Then animals would nibble on the babies. So we do a lot of classes for kids, and there's always a kid who says, I don't think it's a very good idea to have your kid hanging from a beam. And we said, yeah, but it's not too great to have your kid nibbled on by a pig either. <laughs> so underneath all that swaddling, the baby wore a diaper, but the diaper was actually called a clout. And just like in Elizabethan times, they only changed that clout every three days. <laughs> so if the diaper was poopy, which you can bet it was, very often they would just take it off, shake it out, hang it by the fire to dry, then put it back on the baby. And sometimes we sit around in our kitchen and we say, can you imagine what it was like in good old days? You know, diapers roasting by the fire, uh, babies hanging from beams, puppies nursing from women. So. <laughs> so the next thing that would happen in a kid's development, when kids got to be about walking age, they all wore something called a pudding. And a pudding was a big padded cap, that, that's not a very good picture, a big padded cap around their head and a big padded thing around their stomach. And I've kind of come to think of this kind of as a bumper car situation. <laughs> because the colonists believe that every time a baby fell down, its brain would get mushier and mushier, kind of the consistency of pudding. So you've heard the expression, pudding heads? Yeah. That's where that came from. Now the next thing that happened in development is that all boys' clothes and girls' clothes and dolls' clothes, they all have these things called lead strings. 
and kids stayed in lead string until they were about six or seven years old. And when I first read about this, I was like, I don't get this. I don't really understand this, because kids were walking by then. And then one time I was in a mall, and I got one of those aha moments because I saw a kid on a leash. And I was like, oh, OK, now I get it. If your kid's wandering too close to a bubbling pot of something, you just kind of yank them back. So normally, kids came out of lead strings at age six or seven, but it wasn't that uncommon to keep girls in lead strings until they were 18 years old to show they were under the thumb of the man in the family. So babies were nursed for 18 to 24 months, and weaning wasn't gradual. It was a complete and sudden thing. And very often, women went on something called the weaning journey, where they'd go away for two weeks without their baby, and by the time they came back, the baby would be weaned. Um, they would never take these journeys in July or August, because they believe that brought on something called bloody flux, which I'll talk, which I'll talk about in a sec. Um, they also believed teething was a very dangerous time in a baby's life, and many colonial babies wore red coral bracelets. There's nothing actually in coral, but apparently chewing on the coral kind of helped babies, help babies' gums. So once again, I love the whole full circle aspect of things. And have you all seen ba uh, babies, modern day babies, wearing amber necklaces? Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Once I told you, now you're going to see them everywhere. So there's something in amber called succinic acid, and it really does help with teething, helps with a lot of kinds of things. And once again, we love hearing these stories. We were speaking, I think, in Franklin, Connecticut. And when we were all done, there was a 17-year-old girl named Michaela. And she came up, and she was talking to us. And she said that she had had really bad, like really, really, really bad menstrual cramps. So she went to the family doctor, and the guy put her on the pill. And she didn't want to be on the pill in the first place, and she had really negative side effects. So she decided she was our kind of girl. She was going to take matters into her own hands. So she started researching amber bracelets and amber necklaces. So she got herself an amber necklace. She put it on. And within two days, she never, ever had a menstrual cramp ever again. Eris has a lot of teenage and college girls as her um, clients. So she always recommends these amber necklaces. I have one on my ankle all the time. So once again, I just love the whole full circle aspect of things. And I think it's just pretty cool. Now, once toddlers pass through teething, oh, that's Michaela. Once toddlers pass through teething and weaning, parents kind of gave a collective sigh of relief. Because if your kids survive till age 11, 11 years, there's a pretty good chance they'd survive to adulthood. Now, at a time when one in 10 infants didn't survive the first year, little girls were given dolls, but they weren't given dolls in cradles. They were given something called coffin dolls. Yeah, because they thought they taught that they taught this about learning about death through play and the necessity of being good in order to attain salvation. Now, as I said, I dragged Eris around to a lot of cemeteries, and taking pictures of headstones really doesn't work very well. But there were four epitaphs we thought were especially moving, so we copied them down. So one of them was um, it was four brothers, they're ages five, nine, and twelve-year-old twins, and they all died. died I think it was between December and February, and their headstone was a tree of life with four broken branches. So these really break your heart. But ye living mortals see an earthly bloom, for a lovely of springs lie beneath his tomb. The afflicted mother weeps from day to day to see those lovely branches torn away. These things are just horrible. Now, of course, the colonists had very limited medical knowledge, and there was one family where, believe it or not, they lost fourteen children. 14. And somehow they figured out how to do with the RH factor, you know, right? RH incompatibility. So this one is, youth behold and shed a tear, see 14 children slumber here, see their image how they shine like flowers of a fruitful vine. The next one is the one that bothers me every time I do this talk. Of course, many women died in childbirth, and there was a 19-year-old woman named Sala Barnes, and she and her baby died in childbirth. This one just really killed me. Remember friends, a solemn hour, I was a mother in a tomb. In dreadful pains, a corpse I bore, and soon a corpse myself became. This season is just heartbreaking. And there are many epidemics. And they will mother, a loving wife, who of the smallpox departed this life. Now, I don't talk too much about death and dying in this, class, in this presentation, but Eris and I took this photo in Litchfield, Connecticut. And can you see how the headstones and footstones are kind of supposed to resemble a bed? You really don't see the footstones very often because anymore because now with weed whackers and riding mowers, it's hard for the cemetery workers. So they either get rid of them all together or they kind of tuck them there behind the headstones. And people ask me all the time, what does it say on the footstones? Usually it's just the person's first name and the year the person died. And there's headstones of babies all over our New England cemeteries, and all of them are heartbreaking. Is it time? To, what? Go to the conclusion? Is it time? What time do we have to end? Oh, 
Well, I'll just keep talking. If you guys have to go, we'll just go. How's that sound? <laughs> so <laughs> it's an hour long talk, so we didn't know what to cut out. So what we got to stick this in bed is, and I'll talk even talk faster than I am. So smallpox was killed, called smallpox, to distinguish it from the great pox, which was syphilis. So I, obviously, these are not colonial photos, but I never saw smallpox. I figured maybe other people haven't either. So it reappeared in the colonies every 10 to 15 years. Particularly devastating to Native Americans. I think most people know. Well, the theory is that Pocahontas, when she went to London in 1635, she died from smallpox. So smallpox killed 20 to 30 of every hundred it struck. You could have—I had no idea your whole body was covered like that. You could have thousands just on your face. And the colonists used vinegar-soaked bags over the nose. They were amulets of animal teeth or bags of camphor around their neck. They wore garlic in their shoes, and they carried lengths of tarred rope. So if the pox didn't touch, you know what I mean, touching like this, you had a pretty good chance of surviving. If the pox did touch, they developed something called confluent smallpox. And with confluent smallpox, you had a 60% chance of not surviving. If you read a lot of British or American literature like I do, you're always hearing about people having pockmark scars. And I kind of wondered, what does it look like? So of course, I couldn't find a photo. But this is uh, Robespierre from Madame Tussaud's Wax Museum. I think actually it's not a very bad case of pockmarking. But I included this to remind me to tell you that colonial women used to carry on these little metal tins. And then the metal tins, they had paper beauty marks in the suits of the four cards, you know, hearts, I always say hearts, moons, clovers, but you know what I mean? So they would take these paper beauty marks and put them on their pockmark scars, which kind of cracks me up because I wonder, like, who the heck do you think they were fooling? And I would just love to have seen a photo from back then. So I stopped giving the smallpox vaccine in 1972, allegedly it was eradicated in 1980. So the most common cause of death in kids was something called bloody flux, which they also called summer complaint, which we now know actually is dys dysentery. So the primary symptom was bloody diarrhea. It was occurred to the oral fecal root. And they used to give kids pills made from black pepper, flour, and turpentine. Oh. If that didn't work, they tried this remedy. So take an egg and boil it very hard, then pull it off the shell and put as hot as you can well endure into the fundament or anus of the patient grieved. So first of all, I think um, you're going to see the colonists are really big on shoving things up the rear end. And you're probably never going to look at egg salad the same way. I think. <laughs> I think the next slide is my absolute favorite. So if you had the wind or the colic, all you needed was a pipe and a really, really, really good friend. So the idea here is that the small end of the pipe would go in your rear end, then your really good friend would be at the other end of the pipe. And when I did my very first talk, someone raised their hand and they said, do you think that's the origin of the expression, blowing smoke up your? <laughs> and apparently that, that expression has a lot of origins, so I'm not sure about this one. Now, we're all, we all know about bleeding. I just didn't know how bad it was. So apparently they would take six to eight pints over a two-day period. That's 10 times longer for today's blood donors. And we all know about leeches. I didn't know about some of these uses. Apparently leeches are physicians with lower leeches down patients' throats. Um, if you're a guy, I apologize, but hundreds of them would be used to bleed a man's testicles over several days. Oh. Leeches were also applied to the vagina to help relieve sexual excitement. And I had a woman sitting right there one night and she said, yeah, that would do it. <laughs> <laughs> and doctors pushed them up the anus because they were pushing everything else up the anus. <laughs> So if you had the shingles, all you needed was a house leak, cat's blood, and cream. And people have gone on to tell me that, ha that house leak is actually um, hens and chickens. Oh, you see the little black cat there, good point. Um, apparently the colonists really did have a love-hate relationship with black cats. They really did fear them, but apparently it would be very uncommon to find a black cat that didn't have little notches taken out of its ear, because even though they feared them, they used their cat's blood in all kinds of different recipes and remedies. Now, I kind of like this one. There's a guy named Dr. Talman from Guilford, Connecticut. This is his recipe to cure deafness. So take a bat and clean him, leave his eyes on, his skin in, and hang him up by the head. There were then instructions to extract oil from the bat and apply it to the patient's ear with negger's wool. Now, for the longest time, I was like, negger's wool, negger's wool. What the heck is negger's wool? Until I finally figured it out. It was the hair of an African-American person. Yeah, it took me a long time for that one. And I think this recipe is probably the creepiest one of all. This is called swallow water. I forget what it cured, but Eris and I got into a little debate about this one. So take 40 or 50 young swallows. When they're ready to fly out of the nest, the more the better. Bruise them in a, in a mortar and pestle. Add two ounces of castoretum, which is a beaver's anal glands, uh, to fine powder, and three pints of strong white wine vinegar. Mix all this well together and set it to still as a rose water. Now, Eris and I got into this debate about this. Eris said, where would you find 40 or 50 young swallows who are ready to fly out of the nest? I said, Eris, I don't care. I could not even take one baby swallow and smoosh it up in a mortar and pestle, could you? 
So um, once again, I had someone in an audience, and she said that her son, this is modern day, was living in China with his wife, and apparently they had a really, really difficult labor and delivery, and the Chinese doctor prescribed swallow water at $1,000 an ounce, and apparently really did help it, so that swallow water had something to do with childbirth. Should I stop now and let you guys go? Oh, no. Yeah? <laughs> yeah? No. I don't know. What do you want me to do? Keep going? Stop? Yeah. No. Keep going? Okay, I'm going to leave up. Cut out odds and ends. I'm going to go at a conclusion. So um, I kind of like this slide because I think it shows how much and how little has really changed for women. We all know the statistics about maternity leaves, and I think it's probably time for a woman president. Maybe not that woman, but a woman president. But the whole point of my talk is perhaps women need to be reminded of how far we've come in order to see how far we still can go. Like, for instance, did you know that in, I think it's now 34 states, there are still attacks on tampons and pads because they're considered a luxury item. <laughs> Connecticut, we just repealed it in July. I don't know about Massachusetts. I think you don't have it. Um, have you also heard, are you familiar with something called the pink tax? So pink tax is not a real tax, but there's products that boys and men use, and women and girls use the same products, but it's, they cost more. Showing pictures to you is just much easier. Like, for instance, I see no difference between these two razors other than one is pink and one is blue. Um, who knew there were pink or blue earplugs, and why should there even be that? Who knew that there were male and female calculators? I had no idea. <laughs> Apparently, these identical shirts, I mean, that's a big price difference there. I don't go to a dry cleaner, but someone said it's much more expensive a woman's blouse clean than a man's shirt. And my all-time favorite is this stool softener. What the heck could be in that pink stuff? <laughs> <laughs> and it also trickles down to things for kids. Like, take a look at these mobiles. I think the blue one is intended for boys, the pink one for girls. Um, these scooters, there's a huge price difference there. Wow. Yeah, wow. these roller blades. I think the, the ninjas are meant for boys and the frozen ones for girls. And here's my favorite at Walmart. For one Barbie is 2307, but a G.I. Joe, a gas mask, a dog, a couple of his buddies, 2299. <laughs> so my last thing I'm going to share with you, if you ever had a baby, whether it was a home birth or a hospital birth or it was a midwife, aren't you glad whoever trained to deliver your baby didn't train on this thing called the obstetric phantom? <laughs> this is how medical students train to deliver babies. So another view, another view there. For the longest time, I couldn't figure out what that pillow thing was. Then I had a bunch of EMTs in the audience one time. They said they thought it was the placenta. And my final thing I'm going to share with you are my yellow legal pads. I think you can tell I'm kind of an interesting, interested person in all kinds of things. And I always had these yellow legal pads all over the house. I was always taking notes on them. The kids were always like, Mommy, you and your legal pads. Then when this crummy stuff happened to us, my yellow legal pads just kind of sat by the side. Then when I discovered colonial women, I started taking notes again, kind of felt myself coming back to life. So every time I do this talk, I kind of feel like I'm paying tribute to the women who saved me. And I just ask that once in a while you think about our foremothers, whatever the generation, because to me it's miraculous any of them survived any of this stuff. That's a appreciated voice for my talk. Thank you very much. Not to be a Tupperware kind of or pampered chef thing, but if you're interested in getting on our mailing list, there's a wooden book right there. I swear to you, we send one email a month. No, no obligation, but if you're interested, go right ahead. Thanks for coming. Yeah. That was the fastest I ever talked in my life. <laughs> and I'm a fast talker. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Glad you weren't offended. Oh, thank you. I would like that because I really I had to chop out a lot and talk so fast. Yeah. Okay. Make a recommendation to somebody. I don't know who it is, but. I think that I'd actually.